Wonderful. So thank you so much again for uh, joining uh, SCCR Science Series. Uh, we are honored to have here with us Dr. Everett Mayer and Dr. Stefan Busk. Um, and uh, the topic of the of today's science series is the Stanford experience pioneering the clinical treatment of mixed uh, hematopoietic chimerism to induce uh, transplantation tolerance. And uh, uh, we are honored to have Dr. Everett Mayer with us. Uh, he is the Associate Professor of Division of Blood and Marrow Transplantation and Cellular Therapy with a courtesy appointment in surgery and pediatrics. He's a, he, he has a focus on the preclinical and clinical study of immune tolerance. He serves as a director of the Cellular Immune Tolerance Program, supported by Department of Medicine and uh, Surgery, and which receives a clinical trial um, support from SCCR, uh, Stanford Center for Clinical Research, which we are part of. Um, his uh, scientific focus is uh, uh, the study of hemopoietic uh, chimerism and uh, uh, Treg uh, cell therapy. And then we have, uh, we are honored to have Dr. Stephen Busk here with us. Uh, he is a, a professor in the Division of Abdominal Transplantation Surgery. He serves as Director of Adult Kidney and Pancreas Transplant Program and Surgical Director of the Cellular Immune uh, Tolerance Program, and is widely regarded as a leading expert in the clinical uh, implementation, uh, Im implementation immune tolerance in kidney uh, transplantation. His research interest is focused on the improvement of clinical uh, immunosuppression. He's involved in the evaluation of new immunosuppressive drugs, potentially more efficacious and less toxic with the ultimate goal of achieving tolerance. Uh, thank you so much for being here, um, Dr. Mayer and Dr. Busk. We are honored to have you. Please take it over. Thank you very I much. It's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so so um, Stefan uh, and I are going to do a tag team approach. Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, I'll just start by saying uh, what is mixed hematopoietic chimerism conceptually, um, since this is <laughs> probably a, a, a unique term. So what it means is that two immune systems coexist together in one person. Um, and why would you do that? Uh, if you have, if you're in need of an organ transplant or tissue from another person, um, obviously your own body would reject that tissue. And mixed chimerism has been shown historically and in clinical practice to allow one to accept a donor graft without the need for further immunosuppression or lifelong immunosuppression. So, um, so this is the this is a central problem of organ transplantation. Uh, Stefan works in kidney transplantation, and this is where a, a lot of our innovation has occurred because we have the opportunity to use living donors in kin, in bone in kidney transplantation uh, because one kidney can come from a donor and the donor can still do well. Um, but a huge problem in organ transplantation is rejection, and you can see here uh, the histological rejection of tissue with complete effacement of the architecture and a heavy infiltrate of immune cells, in particular T cells, acting to destroy the kidney. So individuals who go through organ transplant in order to prevent this process receive lifelong medications, which have a lot of side effects. And one goal is to actually see if we can come up with a way to have your cake and eat it too, do the transplant and have the uh, new kidney accepted without the need of immunosuppression. Uh, Oh, I just froze. I apologize. Okay, there we go. Oh, no, <laughs> I got kicked out. Oh, there we go. Sorry. So um, immunological rejection occurs fundamentally uh, along many different pathways, but one of the most important is the T-cell pathway. And here shown by electron microscopy is a T-cell attacking or interacting with an antigen presenting cell. And these cells are, are capable of learning about your interior environment by this interaction. And they're capable of discriminating something that is foreign and destroying it, which makes sense because they do that all day. Uh, they destroy viruses, they destroy bacteria, fungus, 
other opportunistic uh, infections. So it's a very powerful evolved system that we're trying to overcome. It's also very empiric how it works, you know, is not uh, necessarily algorithmic, but historical. It is an incredibly interesting and powerful system. So the way your body looks at itself is through these immune receptors called human leukocyte antigen. And there's two different classes of them. There's 12 of these proteins. And these, what happens is these your different cells of your body incorporate proteins and, and other uh, factors from the environment, and they present snippets of these proteins in these molecules. So the, I always tell my patients, these are like the eyes of the immune system. They're constantly looking, uh, your the immune cells are constantly looking at these molecules in order to create a picture of the world. And they're actually a primordial intelligence. They will interpret what they're seeing and they will respond accordingly. So the immune system is programmable, uh, which we all know from vaccines and vaccination. And that, that leads the opportunity that it might be possible to achieve tolerance by reprogramming the immune system. Um, on the other side, you have T cells and T cells are amazing. They're actually, every T cell is unique because they have a receptor that binds to the MHC molecule called the T cell receptor. And this just shows that these T cell receptors are produced by parts of our genome that recombine within individual cells. So this is the evolution of adaptability, which is amazing. So your T cells are able to, in real time, generate a diversity of unique individuals, each capable of uniquely recognizing different parts of, of uh, this, the proteins that are expressed on the MHC. So these T cells are constantly surveilling and looking, and if they see something foreign uh, that presented through the MHC, they'll attack. Um, it's, it's an amazing system. So if you think about um, the immune repertoire, you have literally billions of these T cells in your body. Um, you can kind of pictorially think of them as little dots in your body moving around constantly looking and constantly exploring and constantly integrating. So they're they're sensing what's going on in the body. They're communicating with themselves and other immune cells, and they make a determination. They make a decision, and they form memories, and they do all sorts of functions to keep you healthy. Well, one of the major trends in immunotherapy uh, that is very exciting um, and that we're seeing reach the clinics is this idea that the immune system and the individual components can be reprogrammed or edited. So if you have an immune system that's gone awry, you don't necessarily need to leave, use a sledgehammer or blanket immune suppressors that suppress everything, but you might be able to articulate um, and reprogram the immune system to new states. Um, so you know, classically what we've done uh, to allow transplantation is use a lot of immunosuppression to dampen down the immune system. And, and hope that through mechanisms we are just understanding that it, lear it eventually learns how to accept a graft. And this includes agents such as tacrolimus HG steroids that have been around for, thankfully, but they've been around for decades. In the, in the new era of cellular immunotherapy, uh, you know, we're capable of uh, expanding T cells, reprogramming them in vivo, um, genetically modifying them. And there is this opportunity to edit this repertoire. <clears throat> so in cancer immunotherapy, we have holes in our repertoire that occur when we get cancer. So our immune systems are unable to attack and clear the cancer. And one of the big revolutions that has occurred in cancer is the idea of using immunotherapy or even targeted cellular immunotherapy to restore immunity to the holes in our repertoire. Uh, and that's done through all sorts of approaches, including trans bone marrow transplantation, and also through genetic engineering of cells to directly target. On the flip side, you have individuals, for example, with type one diabetes, who have an autoimmune process that is attacking very specific cells in their body. Um, so that also might be something in the future we can reprogram. And there are a lot of preclinical cell therapies that are amazing. They're science fiction level that are just sitting in the labs waiting to be explored in humans safely. And so that's a major challenge for us. So going back to um, kidney transplantation, uh, which Stefan does very elegantly and, and skillfully, you have kidneys transplanted into this amazing repertoire. And so there isn't just one response. This kidney has usually comes from an unrelated donor 
often a deceased donor and is very mismatched in HLA. So it's incredibly immunogenic. So huge swaths of the immune system will attack and recognize the kidney and want to destroy it, rightfully. It's foreign. Um, but that presents a challenge because this is a huge antigenic load, a huge new foreign body in some in someone's uh, own body. And uh, the immunological reprogramming necessary um, to, to achieve tolerance is, is a heavy lift. So... <clears throat> Uh, there is an answer <laughs> and uh yeah it starts with cows um so you you may appreciate uh sorry it's a little grainy but these cows are mosaic so they have different colors sometimes black spots white spots brown spots and these cows are literally mosaics of each other so in the fetus their um their umbilical structure and placental structure allows for different cells to to travel between different cow embryos. So they actually become literal hybrids of each other in each litter. Um, and that's depicted here in terms of the yolk sac and, and then the developing placental and having two different um, cows and some cells from one primordial cells, especially from the blood system or skin or, or of their other systems, they, they interact with each other. And uh, uh, back in the 1930s and 40s, um, a professor by the name of Ray Owens uh, uncovered that you could actually, in these mosaic siblings, you could actually transplant organs and tissues and they would be accepted. Um, and that this seemed to require that the cows have a mixed immune system, um, not necessarily just mixed skin, but the immune system needed to coexist between two individuals in order for this transfer to occur. And this was this is startling, you know. This uh, this is unprecedented that this can occur naturally, and it led to the idea that that maybe you could induce tolerance. And um, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Dr. Medawar, um, in the 1940s and 50s, showed in um, uh, really fun studies to read <laughs> that you could transfer that you could generate mixed hybrids, um, mixed chimera, hematopoietic chimeras, and in mice, and they could adoptively transfer donor tissue, in this case, donor skin, and it would be accepted without any immunosuppression, which is a, a, an amazing scientific possibility. Now, keep in mind that these discoveries, you know, really were made in the 40s. So they were made 85, almost 90 years ago. Um, and they led to the Nobel Prize uh, in the 1960s. So this concept has been around for a while, but it's taken a long time to get to humans. Um, and uh, that's true for translational arcs. It takes a huge team, um, and which we'll talk about a lot, uh, like the SCCR, to take something that occurs in mouse and um, move it to humans, and a lot of work. So where does hematopoietic stem cell transplantation fit in? Well, if you want to induce mixed chimerism, you need to put in a donor immune system and bone marrow, and it has to persist. Um, and we do that clinically. Um, in fact, our field was actually born out of these discoveries because many of the early investigators entered bone marrow transplantation with the goal of achieving mixed chimerism. But what happened is they realized that um, with people with leukemia or other bone marrow failure syndromes like aplastic anemia, that this could be the only curative option. And it became its own field where we replace someone's immune system and bone marrow with someone else's in order to cure otherwise incurable diseases, again, such as leukemia, aplastic anemia. And so <clears throat> in that setting, um, you can entertain and a lot of toxicity because the consequences are so dire without treatment. You can do things like irradiate or use high-dose chemotherapy which actually act against the cancer. Uh, so that's, you know, that, that's how the field kind of evolved. But it's been a major challenge to take that new immune system and bone marrow and put it in a recipient in a way that's non-toxic. Um, and that's actually another revolution that's occurring right now as we speak, uh, in part led at Stanford and other centers, is non-toxic bone marrow transplantation. I think the bone marrow transplantation of the future uh, especially for our young coordinators and, and people just getting involved in clinical research, is going to be very, very different. So uh, one of the pi pioneering um, efforts we made was uh, to make a non-toxic conditioning regimen that could be tolerated by people undergoing organ transplantation 
then bone marrow transplantation in, in order to induce tissue tolerance. And a lot of the success depends on how well you're matched. So, so Stefan will get into this. If you remember those HLAs, those quote, eyes of the immune system that you know, your T cells are looking at, the best is to have an HLA matched donor and recipient pair. And in this case, kidney transplant, it's usually, it is a sibling um, and it's uh, a living donor. Um, and so that's, that's what we see here. But one of the problems in the field is that most people don't have HLA matched donors and recipients. Most people are only matched on one allele. So that's a huge immunogenic load. So not only there are two challenges, becoming more safe, but also extending from matched donors to mismatched or even deceased donors. And these are major challenges of the field. And then if you think about bone marrow transplant, there are many people who suffer autoimmune disease in, uh, in around the world, millions of them. Um, and there, this is a potential um, larger bore therapy for them. Um, but if it were safe, there are certain um, autoimmune diseases that could be treated. And there's preclinical evidence that um, in animal models that this can be a curative approach where you can reset someone's immune system. The problem is that there still is risk associated with transplantation. Um, although we, uh, through Stefan's uh, leadership with, with a team of investigators, have shown that um, this is now very safe and practical for HLA matched donors, which is a major achievement. So how does this work? Um, so this, this is Sam Strober, who is an investigator who, who worked at Stanford for 50 years. Uh, he started back in the time when, when Medawar was receiving a Nobel Prize, and there was a lot of interest in the translation of this mixed chimerism depicted here. And he worked steadfast and methodically and built a team um, that, that Stanford is recognized to be a rare center to have assembled and to have made the breakthrough where we can establish mixed chimerism between donor and recipient cells shown here by different colors. Now that mixed chimerism operates and Dr. Strober and, and many others have studied this through different mechanisms of action to reprogram the immune system. The first is that it affects the thymus where the developing T cells go. And the developing T cells um, will, will, will see the donors, um, parts of the donor immune system and stop responding to them. And this is called central deletion. At the same time, there are cells in your body that regulate the immune system, uh, like the police of the immune system or the traffic controllers. Uh, they, they basically will end a strong immune response and they'll help maintain homeostatic functions like repair and other uh, things essential for regenerative medicine. And these T regulatory cells actually, actually play an active role also in the mixed chimerism state, both maintaining it and, and, and allowing the immune system to see the new donor grafts, but not attack it. And this is a major innovation of Sam Strober to come up with the method using very low dose radiation, antithymocyte globulin and donor transplant to achieve this state in individuals. And Stefan will get get into this much more, but just to give you the, the scientific underpinnings. Um, unfortunately, Sam Strober passed away last year, uh, but we're honored to continue the legacy at Stanford in a multidisciplinary transgenerational effort, which I think uh, Stanford has a unique uh, position in many fronts uh, to be able to achieve. So I'm just gonna show you some animal, uh, one animal <laughs> experiment to just show you the power of this. Uh, so this was an experiment done in our lab where we used a little bit of low dose radiation that, that shields the organs that don't need it. Um, the radiation is total lymphoid irradiation. It will affect the lymph nodes and the bone marrow, but your brain will be shielded, your thyroid, other uh, parts that don't need it. And then antithymocyte serum in this case, which eliminates a lot of the recipient T cells. And you do a, don a transplant in mice from a, from a donor mouse that's completely um, genetically divergent. Um, and then if you add Tregs in uh, you, from the recipient, you can help to tolerize. And then we, in this case, we add islets in, um, and then we look many days later to see what happened to the islets. And you can see that in mice that receive the islets alone, they're rejected. The islets in this case are actually glowing islets. They, they've been genetically modified to have firefly uh, luciferase, which is what makes fireflies glow. So you can actually monitor the cells 
in living organisms over time, non-invasively. And you can see that the islets survive with the, the procedure itself. And then with the addition of Tregs, they it's not shown here, they can survive better and longer. Um, so this is, you know, this is a potential curative approach for people, people with type 1 diabetes, because this also works in mice that get um, insulitis. And it just shows you the incredible uh, potential. And also what happens in the lab is amazing. But there's this huge valley of death and getting across the lab to humans. And, uh, and that is um, a kind of a crazy space to charge into a little, uh, 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 um, little bit like attacking windmills. But I think um, a very important space in this generation where the potential is so clear in so many fronts to translate these things. So this gets to an idea of, you know, a central idea in, in medicine, um, which is we are very grateful for what we have, really. It's it's amazing. It's life-changing. But in many ways, we're a victim of our own success. We have a disease and we get to a false summit, which is great. Patients, you know, can be on lifelong immunosuppressive. They can do well. But we know that there's this peak where we could get patients off immunosuppression. And we could have them go back to normal. Uh, but there's this risk because we don't know how to get to this peak. We, we know it's possible, but we don't know how to get there. So I think this is a problem for cellular immunotherapy in particular, because for autoimmune diseases, many organ transplants, we're here and we need to get here. And how do we get there? Well, <clears throat> we have patients willing to take risks. Uh, and these are the astronauts, the heroes that Stefan and I work with, um, and that you work with. Um, and we want to try to, we know there's risks. We don't want them going here. We want them going here. So we have to work as a team with many different disciplines to make the, and have make this possible. And that's really the vision of the CIT is to get to the state. And so I'd like to hand it over to Stefan, who will get into the clinical trial practice. It's been an absolute privilege uh, to work with him um, as a, over, over my career as um, a friend and mentor um, and colleague and co-conspirator. Um, so I, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Stefan. Well, thank you very much. And that's a really great introduction and that will help uh, me um, uh, go through this trial and um, explain uh, things. So Actually, I'm so I'm starting with this picture, and uh, you know, and you see the cap captation uh, contribution on your new transplant. Here's what you have to uh, to take for now on, and the big problem with this is that I took this picture about uh, 20 years ago, and if I take the picture of the discharge medication of the patient transplanted last week, it would be about the same. So many of you may have uh, heard about um, Amy Silverstein, who had two heart transplant, and she wrote a poignant essay, and I think she went on also uh, invited on, on TV about uh, the benefit of her transplant, no doubt, but at now dying of a complication of these me medication. And her kind of point of view what you want to stress is that uh, nothing much has been done to improve the situation in terms of toxicity of the medication over uh, over the last decades and the as dr mayer showed to you the ultimate uh, solution for this is tolerance and if you look at uh, immune tolerance in transplants. The first and foremost benefit, it would be the prevention of rejection lifelong. So the graft would last longer. But the additional benefit is not to have to take these immunosuppressive medication, which have significant side effects and complications. So we talked about one, which is the cancer after transplant, which is increased infection, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. So both the reduction, potential re reduction, in reduction in rejection or elimination of, redu of rejection and elimination of these, the need for these drugs should uh, 
reduce premature graft loss and also premature death. Have basically the patient live longer. And we have this uh, motto in our field that has uh, emerged uh, almost like uh, 15 years ago is to develop therapies and particularly true tolerance to have a kidney for life. So the gift of life could actually last a life. So uh, again, I'm, I think I need to do this. So a little bit of uh, history on the tolerance induction protocol at Stanford. First, there's not a lot of people doing this, you know, if, in the United States or even in the world. So we are one of three leaders. So MGH Harvard started first about uh, uh, 1998 uh, uh, with their, their first uh, combined transplant for myeloma patients. And uh, Stanford, we started around uh, 2000, but really in the clinical investigation sponsored in 2005 and Northwestern in 2008 with a different approach. So both Boston and uh, Northwestern are basically in a holding pattern now uh, due to one for complication, other for findings or, or to be able to have access to their or original medication that they have used. So basically, we're almost uh, the only game in town in development of tolerance after kidney transplantation. So this is based on 50 years of basic and translational research led by Dr. Strober. And a little bit more, more of the history of this. So this started with uh, really early 1977 with the discovery by Dr. Strober that if he used this total lymphoid irradiation, along with some serum to reduce the lymphocyte in the mouse and some bone marrow transplant, it was able to achieve mixed stable chimerism. And that would lead to the tolerance of the graft without graft versus disease. So just going back a little bit, what, what does this come from, the total lymphoid irradiation and why Dr. Sober is using it? So most people are more familiar with uh, total body irradiation, TBI, which is used in bone marrow transplant and even you know, some tolerance uh, protocol, which irradiate the entire body to create space in the bone marrow to accept the donor cells. So TLI was actually event invented here at Stanford by Dr. Kaplan 60 years ago, who is considered to be the father of modern radiotherapy. And Dr. Stober coming from, from, uh, from Oxford, had new tools to uh, study the immune system and work with uh, Dr. Kaplan on his patient. And uh, initially thought that after the treatment of Hodgkin disease, these patients would recover a normal immune system. And to the contrary, he realized that the TLI was actually immunosuppressive. So over the years, he used that TLI as a mechanism to induce tolerance. And also in the animal and, and correlated in the human, was able to demonstrate, demonstrate that the TLI actually is not very much myeloablative, so suppressing the bone marrow, but rather shift the, the cells that Dr. Meyer talked about to a, a state that they would act, reject less. So these are cells are nat natural killer T cells, T regulatory cells, myelosuppressive cells. So you create an environment that favors tolerance, and that's been the backbone of our tolerance induction protocol. So two additional characteristics of our protocol. So when you use, you, you do a bone marrow transplant, you collect the cells from the donor, and usually you give those, the entire bag or the entire cells to the recipient. Here in this protocol, we kind of purify or select the, the product for the stem cells of the bone marrow. And this allows to titrate the amount of other cells we're gonna give, and particularly the T cells. So the T cell of the donor are kind of the, the soldiers of the donor that come in and create space for engraftment. More you give, more you will have engraftment. So we are able by this process to titrate uh, you know, how much we are going to give to achieve uh, the state of mixed chimerism. And also in his wisdom, Dr. Strober developed the protocol to be done entirely after the transplant. So eventually, 
if this is successful, it could be advanced to deceased donor transplant when you do not know when is going to be the transplant. So you can do not have time to kind of condition the patient to receive the organ and the cells. So the, Dr. May already explained this, chimerism, the full chimerism is, is when in, used in bone marrow transplant and, and helps cure the cancer, but this is not something we need to do with a transplant. And the problem is there's a high risk of Graversos disease. So if we aim for mixed chimerism, which is the goal of the, the Stanford protocol, then it's a tolerance in both direction. The donor does not reject this, the, 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 the uh, basically Graversos disease, the tissue of the recipient, and the recipient does not reject the kidney. So the name of chimerism comes from, from this beast called chimera from uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, ancient Greece, Greece and with the head of a, a lion, antelope on the back and the tail of a serpent. So this, this, this is actually the emblem of the American transplant uh, society. So now the timeline in the clinic. So we have started the program with the HLA match in 2005. So what, again, what does it mean to be HLA match or two haplotype match? So you receive your 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 genes from your 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 parents, and in the siblings, there's 25% chance that you receive the exact same pair of basically the, the, the HLA or the, the, the markers of your identity immunologically. So it's one chance out of four between siblings. So this represents the best chance of success after transplant, even in the, done the regular way, but also in bone marrow transplant, it represents the least risk of Graffersos disease. So we thought that would be, this would be the first group of patients that we should uh, 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 you know, incorporate in this protocol because the risk of rejection and the risk of graphic disease would be the, the smallest. So we have actually enrolled 29 patients and I'll, I'll show you we have been very successful enough to move the ladder a little bit in terms of the disparity between the donor and the recipient. So the next step is haploidentical, which means half match. So then it's 50% of siblings, and it's also all parents to child and child to parents. So it does open the, in a way, the number of potential candidates. So it's in terms of, of the first group, it's more proof of, proof of concept. And now we're moving towards a more utility of doing this process. So we have translated this protocol of TL ATG first in 27 patients, and I'm going to share some modification that we have done recently, adding now the two type of radiation, a little bit of the TBI and some other uh, modification in the cell uh, product. And then the next step is uh, moving to even less well-matched patient, which will open also the, the enrollment to more, uh, more patient as uh, this can go outside of the family. So this is a schematic representation of what we are actually doing with the, uh, the patients. So the kidney goes in first, and it's usually a Monday. And the conditioning regimen, which prepared the patient to receive the, the cells, is started after the transplant. So this RATG is, is a medication to reduce the T cells of the recipient, and it's used commonly in transplant, maybe 80% of the patient will receive this medication. So this is not an investigational drug. So basically the only thing that is new for the patient is receive these, this radiation, which is the TLI that starts the second day after the transplant. The dose is relatively small compared to what Dr. Kaplan was doing maybe 40 years ago, this about 20 to 30%. So the patient is discharged on Friday afternoon, and then completes the radiation uh, the following week as an outpatient. And then on the following Friday, after the radiation is all completed, the patient received the cell product. So that cell product has been obtained from the donor, 
the same way as any bone marrow donor. So we give an hormone that's called GCSF that increase uh, the, the, the division of these stem cells that eventually spill out of the marrow and we can catch them in the peripheral blood with this apheresis machine. So the blood comes out, it is spin, collects the white cell and the rest of the blood is given back to the patient. So these cells then are process, as I told you, to be enriched in, in CD34. In, in CD, uh, and we kept a small portion of these T cells that will help in graftment. So in this study for the HLA match, we started with 1 million of these cells. Just for comparison, if you do not do any selection, it will be probably 300 million. So then the patient receive as an outpatient at the ITA. The cell product, it's, it takes maybe 45 minutes, and then the patient goes home and becomes uh, an outpatient and is followed similarly to any, uh, any kidney transplant patient. So in terms of immunosuppression, they receive a little bit of steroids, one month of the, this medication called MMF that is also commonly used in transplant. It's already stopped after one month, and the patient is basically maintained on one drug so which is already less than patient would be uh, usually with two drugs, keeping those two together for six to 12 months. And then we would stop that drug if we show that we have seen the engraftment of these cells and they're present for at least six months to nine months. The, we have changed the move. We have changed our, our, you know, our move, our target as we got more, uh, more experience with the process. And we needed to demonstrate that there was no rejection and no graft rose disease. So then the patient is monitored and we can actually see if these cells are present in the recipient. So this is a test that is done routinely for biomole transplant. It's called uh, the chimerism done with the STR analysis at our own uh, histocompatibility uh, 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 lab here at Stanford. So in this case here, you can see this is actually the first patient. And we can, we can select those cells and see which one are from the donor from cell type. So this is an example of what's mixed chimerism. Full chimerism would be like 100% at the top and fail engraftment would be 0%. So we're really where we want it to be, middle of the road. So for example, the B cells are around 80%. Characteristic to our program, the T cell lag behind and eventually increase. And it could be a good thing because these are the donor T cell that could be involved in the graft host disease. So the arrow represents when the, all the immunosuppression was stopped. In this case, it's cyclosporin. And then the patient enjoyed normal graft function and kept the cells uh, going. We call this persistent mixed chimerism or independent of immunosuppression. So it stayed without the presence of immunosuppression. Actually, most patients after the immunosuppression was stopped, lost the chimerism, but that did not with influence the rejection of the kidney with just two exceptions. So if we look at the outcomes of our patients, so this ran from 2005 and the last patient transplanted in 2016. So a total 29 patients were transplanted, 28 were infused. So out of those 28, actually, you know, more than 80% developed the chimerism and were able to be win off the immunosuppression. So that's 80%, you know, 80 of the patient being successful in this protocol without any modification. So at this point, about 65, 68% of the patient, 90 patient, 19 patients remain off immunosuppression. Now five, actually it's six to 16 years after transplantation. So only two patients broke tolerance, and we do monitor these patients very carefully. Even down the road, they still continue to check their creatinine, nothing very complex. They can do it at a lab near their, near their house. And uh, if we see an increase in creatinine, then we promptly uh, do a biopsy and see if rejection would be, would be, uh, would be uh, uh, diagnosed. And only two patients broke uh, tolerance. And these were easily treated, and the patient just go back uh, to their uh, immunosuppression as uh, the regular patient would have done. And some patients have kidney disease that are known to come back, and we feel that putting back 
on some immunoglobulin may be beneficial. So three of these patients were in that scenario. And five of the patients did not, uh, uh, we were not wind off immunosuppression because they did not achieve the chimerism and or when the ultimate test, which is reducing the immunosuppression doing a biopsy, they had some evidence of rejection and this was treated and we kept them on their drugs. So tolerance, the tolerance definition is actually after one year of, immuno, of immunosuppression, you need to demonstrate uh, that there is no active immunologic destroying uh, uh, effect in the kidney. So most of all patients that came off at the biopsy at the time, at the time of uh, getting off medication, and most of them had a biopsy one or two years later. And even to the naked eye, you can see that the, well, they look pretty good. If you would see rejection, there will be a lot of blue dots. These are almost identical as a, kin, a, a non-transplanted kidney. They are pristine. And also the difference between over immunosuppression and tolerance is that you still need to be able to fight infection and have recovered your immune system. So these studies showed that exactly that. So if, if you do a, a evaluation of your immune system to respond to, to foreign uh, uh, cells from a donor, which we call the third party. So we can show that the patient, this patient is actually number four, responded before the treatment and after being completely off immunosuppression. So this patient, this patient has still an intact immune, immune system. But if you compare to the donor, they were reactive to the donor, but even off immunosuppression, even in vitro, they were not reactive. And they're still able to respond to antigen, so they have an intact immune system. So with this success with the HLA match, we felt that we were equipped to tackle the haplomatch. But we knew that this would be more difficult and there would be resistance to engraftment. So basically from the get-go, we had two goals. One is we needed to show that we can achieve mixed chimerism of at least one year based on our experience with the HLA match. And the tool that we have based on the animal model and the knowledge of, uh, of engraftment biology in bone marrow transplant, that the T cells would be the key to favor engraftment and thus increasing gradually a dose escalation of the T cell to the point that we will have achieved this goal of mixed cameras. And then if the patient do achieve that goal, then they could enter a program of uh, drug withdrawal, which we would start with the MMF and followed by the tacrolimus at one year and one year and a half. So the protocol basically remain almost the same. The difference is that CD3 dose escalation. So you remember only 1 million of T cell was sufficient to get the patient uh, tolerant with the HLA match. And here we had to escalate the dose from three up to 150. The immunosuppression was prolonged. So this MMF that was only one month, prolonged to nine to 12 months. The tacrolimus up the goal up to one year and a half. Same criteria, mixed cameras needs to be present and uh, biopsy negative for rejection and no graft source disease. So in this slightly busy table, we, I show you all the patients who participated in this study including two patients with a collaboration with University of Wisconsin. And the second uh, column, uh, the CD3 dose. So you can see we escalated from three up to 150 million. And in these column, you can see uh, over time, up to one year, the percentage of donor cell, that's the cameras. So what's important to just gather from that slide is blue is good. So blue is the one year achievement. So you can already see it's pretty random and it is not increasing with the T cell escalation and it is less than 50%. So in terms of achieving our goals, 
person, persistent mixed cameras of more than one year, out of 27, only 11 patients achieved that goal. However, those patients, they moved to the, the withdrawal program and we started with MMF and they were all successful. This was really uneventful. There was no loss of chimerism. Most patients received a biopsy, it was absolutely normal. However, when we move to the next step, which is withdrawal of tacrolimus, the outcome was not as favorable. So eight out of 11 of the patient lost their chimerism when they were off tacrolimus, some for a few months, or they were just getting to below the, the therapeutic level. And three of these patients had rejection, which were able to reverse. But this was different than what I showed you with the match patient, where even if you lose their chimerism, you will not have rejection. So for safety reason, we decided to halt the withdrawal of tacrolimus if the patient had lost the chimerism or rapidly going below 20%, or they, even if they were off immunosuppression, we would just reinstitute the immunosuppression. So there was no subsequent rejection in that group of patients. And for the three patients who still had some chimerism, they, they kept the chimerism on the minimal dose of the tacrolimus and MMF. So at this point for the TLI ATG, haploidentical, what is the lesson learned is that the immunosuppressive independent chimerism and withdrawal of immunosuppression was not achieved. And the T cell dose escalation actually failed you know, contrary to what we've seen the animal model to enhance engraftment. So we needed to make a change. So you can do two things in our appreciation, either increase the intensity of the conditioning regimen or modify the cell product. And we're actually entering both options, but starting first with the intensity of the conditioning regimen. So we thought that maybe because of the property of the TLI, we may not leave enough space in the recipient to accept the cell. And we decided to add a very small dose of the total body radiation this time. And Dr. Strober, per his process, went back to the lab and showed that this made a big difference in the animal model. So it would, in a very stringent animal pair combination, it would make the difference in favoring uh, the engraftment to mix cameras. And our colleagues from BMT, Dr. Meyer and Dr. Lofsky, have a similar program in BMT with the LATG, where some patients did not have uh, enough engraftment, and they added this low dose of TBI and successfully increased engraftment without any additional toxicity. So then we thought that in terms of safety and potential improvement, we were ready to move to the clinic. Also, Dr. Meyer is an expert of Tregs, as you have uh, seen from his previous uh, presentation, and also other investigators from Northwestern uh, University are also. And uh, the Tregs may also favor engraftment, demonstrated in the abdominal, um, animal model. And uh, we have developed a another uh, kind of sub uh, uh, group of this uh, uh, protocol to add expanded or cell-sorted Tregs to the cell product to favor engraftment. So this program is a little bit more uh, nascent, so we, I will not be able to give you results on this one, and we'll concentrate on the TBI for today. So this is the outcomes of the first five patients who benefit from this TBI dose uh, addition. So this is the first patient, and now you're familiar with this graph. So this for first patient in terms of chimerism actually flipped to 100%, and this is full donor chimerism with the dose of TBI of 80, but we were still at the T cell dose of 150 at that point. So this patient developed actually graft disease, very mild, limited to the skin, and was put in remission within three months. At one year, this patient was stopped of strong immunosuppression, was only on prednisone, and which has been tapered subsequently. So this patient is now two years of immunosuppression, a bit more than three years after transplantation, 
without an immunosuppression, no signs of graft resuscitation disease, acute or chronic, and, and perfect kidney function. So this patient is actually quite successful. However, the outcome of graft resuscitation disease is unpredictable. So we still prefer to stay in the range of mixed cannibalism. So we have proceeded with a de-escalation of our uh, uh, conditioning regimen going from 80 to 40 and the cell from 150 to 50. And this is the result of uh, the following four patients, which is high mix chimerism, exactly where we need to be. So the winning process of the, uh, of the drugs is in progress. And I can share with you that it is really promising. So if you compare the chimerism in different blood type, uh, old blood, CD3, a bit like we've seen in the first graph, to of the, these five patients with the TBI, to the most successful of the TLI-ATG alone, which are the 11 patients, you can see there is a big significant difference in terms of engraftment. So we think for that group of patients, this is a turning point. So we always have to talk about safety when we do something that is pretty avant-garde like this. And if we compare the one-year survival and five-year survival of the patient of the graph of the patient in this study, and that includes all uh, most of the patient, is 100% at one year and graph as well. And at five years, US can compare only at three years. They don't have stat statistics. So it is, it is uh, uh, certainly within the range of uh, what is expected, if not even better. So over the years, uh, the, some patients have died, and this is in range of what we expect with this patient population. Usually, it's it, what happened and what we see in standard of care patient is the card, uh, cardiovascular disease, and some graft were lost and not we think not related to to the to the uh, protocol and these are usually disease coming back so one thing that it was a bit disappointing about the tolerance even if we're able to control rejection it appears that we are not able to control some of these disease that are known to come back in the uh, standard of care population so rejection of course, if you're reducing medication, you increase your risk, and we have discussed those. So in the match patient, the five episodes which all resolved, and in the mismatch, same thing, three that were resolved. One patient had an episode of rejection, but had stopped uh, his medication on his own while not chimeric, and but now he's, he's, back, he's back on track and doing very well. And one patient, we had to reduce the immunosuppression to allow pregnancy, which resulted in a, a rejection, but the pregnancy was, uh, was uh, uh, normal to term, and the patient had to re re resume uh, dialysis a few years later. So we have talked about the graphic disease. Another disease that, that is present in standard of care is BK nephritis, a virus affecting the kidney, which is about around uh, five to 7% of standard of care. And we have seen none of this, despite the increase of immunosuppression. The only signal that we had compared to standard of care patient is zoster, uh, or if you uh, prefer shingles, which is probably the cause caused by the radiation, radiation and the, as it affects the immune, the immune system. But we have resolved this problem by prolonging the uh, preventive medication acyclovir up to two years. Hospital say and readmission, pretty much similar to standard of care. Even 25% of readmission in the first year is similar to the visient uh, readmission rate in the first month after transplant in similar centers than ours. So in summary, HLA match, for us uh, at Stanford, this is almost would be standard of care if would be, uh, if would be approved by insurance with 85% of success and long-term success close to 70%. AF match is still work in progress. Initial ATG TLI alone, less than 50%, but really promising uh, improvement with the addition of a single dose of TBI. 
So we have the the chance to give to give uh, the mic to one of our patients who accepted to share his experience with you um, with you today. And I think in clinical research, we're doing this for our patients, but it's really important to, to, to understand what they want and what they expect from, from investigator to, to do for them and what's their experience in the project you have. So I will stop sharing and we can invite uh, uh, Mr. Penner to, um, to uh, uh, share his experience. And in the chat, if you have questions for uh, Mr. Penner, please uh, write them and uh, we'll, we'll uh, share with him. So, but I will start. So uh, Mr. Penner, if you want to introduce yourself, give maybe a little bit of your is history and your kidney disease. And um, how did you learn about a study and why were you interested to participate? Um, I'm 65 years old. My name's Scott Penner. Uh, for work, I'm a director uh, for healthcare, a nonprofit group. But Years ago, I was at Stanford, and it looks nothing like it does today. And I went through radioactive isotopes going through my body as they tried to figure out why I had hypertension at the age of 24 when they diagnosed it. It was 210 over 110. Well, all they could say is that, well, it looks like you've got beat up kidneys. So in the 90s, when um, sonograms or, or ultrasounds came around, I was diagnosed with hereditary polycystic kidney disease. So Dr. Boos can confirm the new kidney uh, from my donor and my existing kidneys are friends. I think you all know where they put the kidney. It's in your groin area. So my kidneys, you know, instead of being the size of your fist are all around my belly area and up in the front. Um, when I first was diagnosed with that disease, I found out that the average life expectancy was 63. So I've exceeded that. So I feel real positive about that. Um, at the point where I was getting at 20%, that's where my nephrologist basically hooked me up with you guys at Stanford, and I learned of this, and, and because I was younger, <laughs> well, I don't say younger, because I was fairly healthy at, at 63 and hadn't yet been on dialysis, I guess I was a good candidate, and, um, uh, you know, I could have gone either way at that point. I have had a very nice life, and if I you know, my life expectancy now was 63. Well, that would be it. But obviously you gave me a bigger life expectancy, another 20 years, according to Dr. Boosk. And uh, if I take care of this kidney and, and I don't screw it up, and that's a positive thing. I just recently got a new child. My son finally got married and had a baby. And uh, so I'd like to be around for that 20 years or 25 years or however long I can make this kidney last by being a compliant patient. So that's kind of my motivation to do that is uh, become a grandpa. Okay, so um, so you heard about the the study, and so uh, from what you heard, and maybe the decision to go in, and did did it happen the way we told you it would happen? And was it was it difficult? Was it easy? Uh, what was your patient experience? Um, when I went into surgery, I had no expectations of what was going to happen. Was I going to wake up? Was I not going to wake up? So my experience of the surgery was I got wheeled in, they put a port in my arm, they injected me with some stuff that felt very cold going in and I tasted blue Slurpee in my mouth. And that's all I remember until nine o'clock that night when I get shaken awake to take some medication. <laughs> oh, wow. I guess I made it. <laughs> then they said, oh, by the way, we've got to clean you. So the first thing um, they did is they said, you know, we're going to have to roll you over. This is going to be painful. And I looked at them and I said, roll me over. Why? And so I arched my back, put my feet up and raised up on my shoulders and said, okay, clean my bottom area. <laughs> and they go, how can you do that? And they said, people like you are normally weaker than this. <laughs> Were you ever on dialysis? No. So they were amazed that I was the only patient in the PACU that they can remember that had never been on dialysis, though I should have. I think I was at a 9.9 9, 9 when I got submitted into the hospital. 
and I should have technically been there, but I knew I was three or four or five months away from surgery. And so I said, that's not a place we want to go. We'll, we'll just tough it out. <laughs> um, when I was going to go through this surgery, Dr. Boosk, through part of the counseling, asked, do you have any reservations? And I said, yeah, I understand my daughter's going to feel like crap the next day, and I'm going to feel really good. And he laughed. And I kind of you go, why are you laughing? You know, and he says, well, three days, your daughter will be sent home. Six months, she will back to her normal self. You, on the other hand, are going to go through a, some bad times for six months. You're not going to feel good. He says, yeah, you're going to feel real good that first day. Then we're going to radiate you for two weeks. Then we're going to trend your drugs for the next six months. And your body's going to be reacting to it the whole time. He wasn't wrong. <laughs> Every time he changed drugs, yeah, my body would go through changes. And, you know, you might be lethargic. You might be feeling really good. And all of a sudden, they change the drugs. And it's like, okay, here's another week of readapting. And we'll get back to it. But at about six months, he was right. I really started to feel real good. Um, I've gotten more comments on my collar. I was either green or gray, depending on who you talk to when I was submitted for this surgery. And they all say, now I have very good collar. I've got a lot much more energy, which I agree with. Um, so I would say that everything that I was told was accurate. <laughs> um, did I fully realize it? No, nobody fully realizes it when you go through this type of major surgery. Uh, the scar is almost non-existent. I mean, I had a beautiful plastic surgeon, <laughs> Dr. Boos, thank you. Um, so you, you hardly notice it. Do I, how would I describe it? Basically, you know, it's in your groin area and I want to stand up. So ba basically you put the kidney right in here. And so some days I will feel a little heavier there than others. When I first came out of surgery, I described it as I have a five pound mask here that's hanging off my body and I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> but that was all of the swelling and the drugs, et cetera. Um, as time went on, you know, it's still there. I feel it from time to time. Some days are better than others, but that would probably be, I guess the, the only real comment I've got on it is you just feel like you've got something there that's not normally there. You know, this side feels normal. This side feels like there's a mask there because there is. <laughs> Um, and so if I turn a certain way or bend a certain way or, or stretch a certain way, maybe I'll feel a little more than I, I would have before the surgery. So that's kind of, I guess, my experience of it. Um, we've subsequently hit the one year mark. And so a couple of the drugs have been gone. Uh, we're off the antibacterial and, and then obviously we got rid of the, the one anti-rejection med. Yeah. So you are on on track uh so your charism is is good and strong and so you achieved the first milestone and then the next one is the is the tachronimus there are some things that are unique to me i was a coffee lover i mean to me watching the sunrise with a cup of coffee was the meaning of life my daughter hates coffee she was my donor and um, I find it weird that coffee turns my stomach. Uh, I never was a sweet eater. My daughter is a cookie monster and I found that I have a big sweet tooth now. Uh, my sense of smell has been heightened, which my daughter has. So I'll, I'll, I'll notice things that are unusual like that. Um, her fingernails and hair grow rapidly. <laughs> I find that is my case now. I was pretty much, uh, I've got dark hair here when I never had it before. She's a very dark haired person. I was all gray. Uh, so yeah, there's some things that I've inherited from my daughter that I never thought that I would or, or would so, get. So Mr. Penner, we, don't, we didn't expect this. So these are additional benefits of mixed chimerism. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, having loved coffee and not now drinking it, I don't know if that's better for my outcomes or not, but uh, it was just a, a, it's a weird thing that I noticed because as I was being wheeled back and forth for radiation that first week, I'd go by the coffee bar because that's the way that path went at that point. And it was like, oh man, I'd love a cup of coffee about now, <laughs> but that soon passed. <laughs> so is there anybody in want to have, have question in the chat for uh, Mr. Penner? If not, well, thank you, Mr. Penner, to share your uh, your your experience, and um, I'm gonna move on with the rest of the presentations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we really appreciate you um, uh, sharing your experience. 
um, with the rest of us. Thank you. Can we, can we say one thing as the coordinating team? We just wanna uh, say thank you to Mr. Penner for being a part of the clinical research and uh, for being such a great uh, clinical research participant for the clinical research team. So I'm Lori Ponyo, I'm the program manager. You've talked a lot to uh, Kman Shafiha and uh, Kevin Lee. And so they're here as well, listening to your story. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Can you confirm that you see my screen again? Yes, we do. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so what's the future? So match protocol. So when we look at this experience, you know, this is, you know, we've been doing this 20 years in the clinic. You talk about radiation, cell therapy. This is, is this something that, you know, can only be done at Stanford and only a handful of patients can benefit from this? Or this actually can be done somewhere else. So we have experience with teams, you know, interested in our process that visited Stanford. So a team from Zurich, a team from Tel Aviv. And we have shared, you know, with them our process or protocols, and they were able to implement this in their transplant program. So at this point, from the both of the center, we have transplanted probably more now, but six, last time I talked with them, 16 patients, 13 are off immunosuppression, and three are still in the taper. So that's almost even better result than us. So uh, that's an example of uh, 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 that the protocol is, is, is exportable. And there is a phase three multi-center trial, which has been is sponsored by Meteor, which is a company that has been started by Dr. Uh, Strober, which there's no link anymore with, 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 with the Stanford investigator, but was able to roll out a phase three trial in 12 centers, enrolled 30 patients. And at the interim analysis, they basically have the same success rate as we have. Some of these centers have done only one patient. So this demonstrates that if you're giving the protocol or the recipe and the adequate support, this can be available at a transplant center near you. So for us, what's the next step? So and the next step is the STOP study, so which stands for Study of Tolerance of Organ Previously Transplanted. So there's a lot of patients that have had their HLA adequate transplant, but they were not at Stanford, they were not participating to this study, and they would like to come off drugs. So the question, is it possible to do it after the fact? So you're one year out after the transplant, your donor is still willing to give, to give donor cells. Can you just be back in the same protocol and come off drug within six and 12 months. So this is a protocol that we have actually active here at Stanford and we have a patient who uh, 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 signed a consent and that we're looking forward to, to do this summer. Our impression is that it might be a little bit more difficult because it's after the transplant, but I think we have the tools now and the knowledge to make this happen. The big difference is that you know, families are smaller. So match patient, fully matched patient, which used to be in the United States, 2000 maybe transplant per year, it's probably a fraction of that now. But there's still tens of thousands of patients that have HLA matched. Some have complications from immunosuppression that would like to come off the medication. So for the mismatch, which include the in first in line, the APLO match, well, we think we're at a turning point. We need to complete the enrollment and really test if we can, we can uh, stop the immunosuppression completely. Then the next, next in line are the less than haplos, and we need also to, to continue to evaluate the modification of the cell product. Most patients do receive their transplant from a deceased donor. So can we actually do the same thing with deceased donor transplant? The answer is yes. Where are we going to get the stem cells? You actually, after the organs are all uh, procured from uh, the deceased donor, you can actually recover the bone, the bone marrow from the vertebral bodies. And we have developed at Stanford the manufacturing capability of doing this. 
And we have Dr. Lovsky worked in developing a IND. So we have IND RB approval to move soon in the disease donor transplant uh, arena. And as, as I mentioned initially, this was actually thought of by Dr. Strobers like 20 years ago. And I think we are at the point of uh, exploring these this avenues. Of course, kidney transplant will be first, but now you can imagine that lung transplant recipient, heart transplant recipient, islet cell transplant could benefit from this process as well. So finally, acknowledgement. First and foremost, late Dr. Samuel Strober, who has been the pioneer, the inventor of, uh, of uh, this process, and has really uh, developed this team science before it, there was a name from it, and developed this large group, as you see here, from not only uh, 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 many investigators, but across uh, departments and scientists. And this is a group that has now worked together. I think I calculated that we have had at least 1,000 contact hours with Dr. Stober. So we're well equipped. He has well equipped us to carry the torch and continue this project to and bring it to the finish line. Also, Dr. Stober was absolutely uh, 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 an expert in, in getting funding. And basically, we had interrupted in uninterrupted funding for all the last two decades, and the funding list is here. And now, you know, you can see, and, that, and now we'll move to the, the, the big, bigger picture, which is not only kidney transplant, organ transplant, but this cell therapy intolerance applies to many uh, other, uh, other uh, 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 disciplines and the creation of this CIT. But from a small operation, this is now as a large portfolio, and this will not, we will not be able to, uh, to, to progress uh, further if we had not uh, been uh, taken on the wings of the SCCR. So we are very grateful for the Department of Medicine and Contribution to Bar Surgery to make uh, this happen. And personally, my experience has been uh, 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 fantastic. And if I had to just like uh, do a publicity for, for the SECR, it would go like this. So a word for our, our sponsor of the day, the, the, this, the, the, the SCCR, do you feel stressed about your next RRB deadline? Clinicaltrial.gov updates? Yes, there are updates. IND review? Well, just go pro with the SCCR. You do the science, we do the rest. So with this, I will uh, stop sharing and get back uh, the mic to uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Meyer. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. So kudos to Lori and her team. <laughs> <laughs> And that we will awesome. definitely share Thank these two. <laughs> Sorry about that. Go ahead. Laurie. Oh, yeah. So I have just a few slides. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, everyone. Just so um, within the SCCR, which has been an actual jo uh, uh, absolute joy to work with, um, we have established the Stanford Cell Immune Tolerance Program. Uh, Lori has, is, is the overall manager, and we're recruiting a great team. Feels very special. Feels like a a rock band that you know is playing good music. I keep saying that, but it's true. And the challenge is to is to bridge that gap that I was talking about, which takes a lot of infrastructure. And so we view it like as building the spaceport for the future and really bringing team science together because so much what we do is interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary with um, you know surgery, bone marrow transplant, radiation oncology, nephrology, um, pathology, all these groups working in concert with innovation that have to be coordinated. Um, so the um, the SCCR itself, we have, I mean, uh, the CIT has uh, autologous transplant protocols. Uh, we have uh, new therapies coming with genetically modified T cells and T regulatory cells. And of course, the uh, preeminent um, crown jewel of the organ transplant tolerance program. Um, 
we do think there's the possibility to grow quickly. Uh, we really want to develop a cutting edge research infrastructure, support teams, support clinical translation, build industry collaborations, but most importantly, convert trials to standard of care. You know, really take things that are experimental and make them accessible for all. Uh, and this shows you the, the key uh, clinical trial dashboard that, that Lori has helped develop and that our team uh, works on uh, weekly. With the stop T that was mentioned, the deceased donor, we also have an islet transplant program, CAR T cells for multiple sclerosis, CAR T cells for lupus neuritis, CAR T reg for rheumatoid arthritis. And this shows, uh, this is now seven months ago where we're at and then where we're at now in terms of major milestones. So it's a, yeah, again, thank you, SCCR. Um, there's a culture there, a collaboration that extends beyond our little group. Um, so we wanted to acknowledge that. And um, we also have a credit symposium that we're planning May, 2025. We just came off our first um, biannual um, that really helps encapsulate the field. I think people really saw it as, as a leading effort. And here's our, our team right here, um, uh, standing together uh, with, with um, Stefan Busk. And uh, we really are appreciative uh, and, and uh, for the incredible efforts and like I said, I think we really have something special. So a big thank you. And uh, and I guess uh, any last minute questions? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And definitely your uh, acknowledgement. So we will share it in, uh, even in our all staff. Uh, so thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, please, everyone, feel free to unmute yourself for any questions or put it in the chat. So, uh, this was really very informative and uh, uh, definitely, uh, as you mentioned in the title of your class, uh, your pioneering uh, uh, wonderful research in this area. Thank you so much. So everyone, please uh, come up with your questions. Uh, hi, uh, this is Banu Sharma. Perhaps I will be involved with this project. I'm wondering at this time that have you, uh, at this time, do you have collaboration with other university as we go, or this is just the Stanford at this time, and later on you plan to collaborate with other universities. For example, you mentioned Northwestern. Just please comment. Yeah, yeah. so we have an ongoing collaboration with Northwestern uh, with our T-regulatory trial. Um, we, we have collaborated with Wisconsin in the past. Uh, we are working to integrate with UC Davis um, more locally. And of course, we provide support and guidance to a number of centers, including a close working uh, weekly meeting with uh, Tel Aviv uh, in, in Israel. Um, so th yes, um, the goal is for us to ho hopefully eventually participate um, uh, more as a consortium effort with leading centers to really increase the volumes and numbers of studies. Uh, so that is a, is a goal, uh, acknowledging that, you know, it, um, clinical trial conduct is difficult. Multi centers is even more difficult. But in order for innovation to spread, new ideas to really be explored, um, old ideas to be tested quickly so they don't take forever, I, I think that's absolutely the direction we're going. And Northwestern has been a stalwart, um, the premier center that we're collaborating with. Ah, thank you. Uh, that is fantastic. So people come forward to collaborate uh, with you both, uh, like Dr. Busk and you, uh, because you guys are the pioneer at this time, or you have to approach uh, some of these institutions, or they read the published paper and say, oh, I will contact, you know, <laughs> Dr. Mayer or Dr. Busk, uh, because I'm interested. So how does it go? Just if you may comment on that too. Yeah, in terms of trial participants, uh, Stefan can talk a lot. Mo many come through our referral network. Um, in terms of the trials, though, they did gather national and international attention. And so we have had uh, people come from uh, elsewhere. Um, part of the difficulty, though, is that these, um, you know, we, we're pioneering. So we want to have people initially very close as we learn what to do. But for the matched patients, the HLA matched, we could accept anywhere in the world now. We feel we could manage them. Uh, effectively. Uh, so that I think um, that is a big part uh, that we look forward to working with the SCCR is, is recruitment 
and building the program. Uh, so I think that is very important. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Yeah, I can just add that, um, and maybe Mr. Uh, Penner can confirm this is the the possibility to be off this medication is very attractive for the patients. Yes, I agree. So oh, I'm curious as to, for the recruitment, um, are you looking more at individuals who will be getting a transplant and then let's say harvesting the, the bone marrow of the, the donor? Or have you considered looking um, uh, at past say living donors um, and their uh, recipients to see if uh, if it's still possible to use that cohort as well. Yeah, I think this is what we are. So, okay, let me try go back. So you see our progression is from easier to more difficult. And then to doing after the fact, we're going to reset to the easier to more difficult. So we have to start again with the HLA match who had the previous transplant, their donor is still available. And if this proved to be successful, I think then the next step is half match, and then we'll move back and move up the ladder as we progress with the, 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 uh, 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 the other, uh, other protocols where it's done at the same time as the transplant. Well, uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to ha be able to speak again. Um, it, we are so grateful for the SCCR. And if you ever have questions, uh, please reach out to us um, and our team. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much. The pleasure is ours. Really appreciate your time uh, in your busy schedule to present on on this important topic. Thank you so much. And. Uh, um, Yes, absolutely. We thank um, the patient, uh, uh, Scott Penner. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your uh, experience with uh, with us. Um, really appreciate um, both um, Dr. Mayer and Dr. Busk uh, and also the patient. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And everyone, please um, uh, keep in touch. If you have any questions, please feel free to send it our way. Uh, and I will send you the slides and the evaluation. I will actually put the evaluation in the chat as well, uh, but I will email it to you. And again, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone. Uh, thank you. Bye, Bye now. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Bye.